reason we wanted to have you on was more specifically some of the work that you've been doing lately around violence in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New. And, you know, when we teach on nonviolence, it's interesting phenomenon for Josh and I and a number of other um, pastors we know that are kind of teaching this and working it out in their church. It's interesting, most of the questions we get that are kind of an objection have little or nothing to do with the Bible. So it's really rare for somebody to say, well, I'm not sure if that's the right way to interpret Matthew 5, or I'm not sure if Jesus actually means that when he says, love your enemies. Usually, we get those occasionally, but usually the questions we get are kind of common sense. Well, if we were to actually do this, ISIS would overrun our country, or North Korea would invade, or people kind of jump to the more political or military implications for our nation, rather than what it means for us as followers of Jesus. But there are objections that people have from the Bible, and nine times out of ten, it's kind of two categories. One is what about Revelation, and the other is what about the Old Testament? Yeah, the whole thing. Revelation, (laughs) you you can get into a little quicker. The Old Testament is, I know, a can of worms when it comes Mm. to this. But we'd love to just chat through those two things with you. So first, I would love to look forward. So I think a lot of people at a cursory reading of the New Testament, you work through the Gospels. It sounds like Jesus is teaching nonviolence and enemy love. Most definitely, he is leading that by example. So at every turn, he rejected the option of military violence against Rome and instead self-sacrificial love, his death on the cross, all of that. Sounds Mm -hmm. like Paul is saying the same thing in Romans 12 and 13, Peter in chapter 3, Hebrews, so on and so forth. And then you get to Revelation and Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth and he's covered in blood and he's riding a stallion and there's an army and there's full on Armageddon, literally, and yeah. people are dying all over the place. And it's like, what what happened to, I thought Jesus was a pacifist <laughs> and now yeah. he's, you know, Russell Crowe from Gladiator or something. So yeah. talk us through how, obviously Revelation is a genre of literature that we don't even have anymore. So it's yeah. it's really confusing to read in our late modern kind of Western context. But talk us through what's going on with all, there's definitely a lot of blood for sure, yeah. and a lot of violence in that writing. Talk us through what's going on. Um, yeah, so let me first pre- preface um, by... Uh, a more global, this is kind of a bigger observation, but it'll be presupposed in everything that we're talking about. And that the more conversations I have about violence in the Bible, I'm realizing personally, and for people I talk to, there's a root issue under this. Um, that I think a, a misunderstanding or a way that we're approaching the Bible, not actually seeing what's going on. Um, and I think it's that we, we lack a category for a kind of literature that's so sophisticated that it can have a whole bunch of something in the story, but it's not advocating that thing. <laughs> so we, and I'll just give you one example, like just from the reason um, that I think most people will get. I, all right, did you guys see Ender's Game? That kind of made a splash when it came out as a movie. Sure. Yeah, I read the, the novel. I, from. I thought the movie yeah. was terrible, but I love the novel. Yeah, it's okay. So, like, mid-1980s, Orson right. Scott Card. If yep. anybody is going to ever read science fiction, this is probably the one that they're going <laughs> to... Spoilers like, may follow for Ender's Game, if you're listening. Yeah. Oh, that's a, well, actually, no. Oh, well, actually, yes. Yes, spoiler alert. If you haven't read the book or the story, oh, can I do this? Can, do I we to... warned him. We warned him. Go okay, ahead. Okay, all right. Duly warned, yes. So, so here's a story that you think for the whole time, this is a story that's, like, pro-war against aliens. Because <laughs> you know? the whole thing is about the training of these pe- of these children right. from their youngest age, all trained to become these like super highly skilled, um, you know, war- spaceship warriors against um, aliens. And then you get to the end of the movie, right? The big thing is, and and it's, what's crucial is actually the last five minutes of the movie changes the entire meaning of the movie, right? <laughs> Because you realize at the end that all of the simulations that you thought were training for this one star character were actually the real battles. And the whole end of the movie goes on to subvert all of the violence that this character just did. He comes to regret it. It's ruined him as a human. 
And you realize this story is really sophisticated, but be, and it's the ending that that makes you go back and reconsider the whole thing. Wow. Um, and I I'm convinced that that something like that the the Bible is is a story that's like that. Um, we we lack the category for the Bible as a sophisticated work of literature, making a profound statement about violence. And so we confuse the many narratives of violence in the storyline, many of which in which God is implicated. I get that. And so we'll talk about that. But just because God's implicated in violence doesn't mean in the overall shape of the story that this is God's ultimate goodwill (laughs) or what God wanted or God's ideal or something that God even started. Um, And it's the ending of the story that makes you know, the real meaning. So as we, it's actually perfect to start talking about the final book of the Bible, because I think it's the book of the Bible that makes you go back and rethink violence all the way going back to page four, which is the first act of violence. So anyway, that's just an analogy that I'm forming in my head. That's so good. We've been talking about the Bible as a story for years now, but I love this idea of it's a story with a, with a surprise ending, whether it's Ender's Mm -hmm. Game, where I think of like, um, Sixth Sense or something like that. Spoilers for the Sixth Sense. Yeah. I'm not, no, I'm not going to say what it is, but you get to the end (laughs) and there is something that happens, which in the Bible would be Jesus, his teaching, Mm -hmm. his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And Mm -hmm. it just reframes the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, but at the same time. It, you can go back now and see that it's yes. totally it was saying in, that all along in sync with where this story was headed, but it's just you didn't think it would actually go down that way. <laughs> yeah, and all sorts <laughs> you know? of things yeah. that you missed the first time around, you start Correct. to pick up yeah. on. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the Book of Revelation is a great, a, a really great example of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, the, back to your first question. So the Book of Revelation. Yeah, it's a. It's a First century Jewish Christian apocalyptic work. That's what Bible nerds call it. Um, And it's a type of writing that we have many, many other examples of it that was, it's like the height of Bible ninjas doing their work. (laughs) Um, That's a mental image. The people nonviolent produce, Bible ninjas. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I, I mean, like in terms of their literary sophistication. So these apocalyptic works. And the Revelation is a, is a pristine example, represent authors who have prayerfully immersed themselves in the Hebrew scriptures for a lifetime. Um, and so they're, every line is packed with some kind of illusion, or I call them hyperlinks, like on a Wikipedia webpage, you're endlessly right. hyperlinking, you know, um, that are hyperlinks back to the story of Jesus and to the, the scriptures of Israel. And so you actually, the book of Revelation is impossible to understand <laughs> uh, if you just read it by itself. It's meant to be read as an amalgamation of the Hebrew Bible plus the story of Jesus. Um, and that's really important because the portrait of Jesus, uh, he, and this is the thing that's confusing, and lots of people have written about this, is one of, one of John the visionary's favorite images. The, the book's about Jesus and about his ultimate victory over yeah. evil and death. It's and the death. revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's the revelation that the crucified and risen Jesus is truly the king of the world right now and will one day be acknowledged by all nations uh, as the true king. Um, and he's on a mission to defeat evil and death forever and ever. Amen. Um, but the way that he is going to defeat evil, um, many people see this is where the disconnect is. Well, Jesus let people kill him <laughs> in the four gospel accounts um, to die for the sins of the world. But on a surface reading, it seems like Jesus has got a sword and he's chopping off heads and he's getting bloody and messy and right. Right. Uh, on the last pages of the Bible. And so for many people, they, they just allow both of those to be true of Jesus and don't think about it. Um, or for many people, they say, yeah, sometimes Jesus lets his enemies kill him, but ultimately he's going to kill them. Um, or we say, is John doing something like Ender's Game, where he is using military imagery, but for a purpose of undermining and subverting the violence uh, that has characterized humans throughout the whole story of the Bible. 
And so you can see this. You want? I can just do a quick walkthrough of this theme. Yeah, hit it. Uh, in Revelation. So, uh, so uh, John first opens with these letters to seven local churches, and uh, some of them are apathetic, um, but a number of them are being persecuted. And to each church, he gives a challenge. He says to the uh, to those who conquer, Jesus is going to give some great gift and reward in the new creation when he vindicates them. So if your neighbors threw rocks at you and you got fired and they killed your uncle for following Jesus, Jesus says, conquer, overcome, and I will give you a a reward in the new creation. So seven times Jesus makes a promise to the conquerors. And the Greek word conquer there uh, is nikao. It's where we get our uh, the brand Nike. Right. (laughs) Uh, Nike means victory. Or conquering. It's a, it's a military conquest image. So he's, what does it mean to call a persecuted religious minority a group of conquerors? <laughs> right? That's such a, you know, it's jolting. Right. Because right? our category for a conqueror is yeah. the victor in a military, you know. Yeah. Kind of Marines. Yeah. Marines go in. They set up <laughs> and, shop. And they're it's... only conquerors if they win. Correct. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that's the kind of language uh, John's using here. So he just sets that up. How is it that these persecuted Jesus communities are going to conquer the world? (laughs) It's such a crazy image, Uh, but it's what he says. And then, so that's the first part of the book. The next part of the book is the revelation of King Jesus. And John sees his vision of God's heavenly throne room. And God has a scroll that represents all of the biblical storyline and prophecy about the meaning and purpose of history and no one can open open up the scroll but then um john hears he's up in this throne room in a vision or having a dream and he hears an announcement that somebody's coming who can open the scroll and it's the lion of the tribe of judah um which is a, a hyperlink back to genesis 49 where the king who's promised messianic king is going to come from the line of judah he's described as this lion who rips apart his prey and no one can overpower him. It's a very, and lions, you know, it's a very ancient image of power, king of the whatever jungle. And, right. And an <laughs> Old Testament image as well, right? That's right. It's a biblical image of the coming messianic king who will be victorious over his enemies. Is a shredding lion. Um, so that, but it's very important. That's what John uh, hears. Then when he turns his head and looks, John's very clear to paint the scene slowly here when he john when john looks he he sees the lion of the tribe of judah and what he sees is not a lion it's the opposite of a lion it's a lamb and it has its throat slit and has blood all over its white wool wow and and this is john's portrait of jesus um throughout the rest of the book until the final scene of the book Jesus is uh, depicted as a bloody sacrifice lamb. Um, so that's important. What he's doing is he's saying the messianic king from the line of David that Israel has been waiting for has arrived <clears throat> in Jesus. So in one sense, Jesus is the lion, but he's the lion who brought about his victory through self-sacrifice, self-giving love, dying for his enemies instead of killing them. I mean, that's so clearly what the image means. Um, It's like a full-on reinterpretation of the imagery and the words. Yes, and actually what he's doing is he's rereading Genesis 49 in light of what that figure turned into within the Hebrew Bible itself, which is the the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And Genesis 49, for those who aren't aware, is the prophecy of the lion from the tribe of Judah. Yes, yep. And then the book of Isaiah, in in the first parts of Isaiah, picks up that promise of the conquering king who's going to be victorious over evil and over the nation. But then within the storyline of the book of Isaiah, we've discovered that that figure is going to overcome and conquer by giving up his life and dying for the sins of his people. Um, so, so in other words, John isn't the one doing the reinvention. <laughs> right. It started before Jesus even hit the scene. Yeah, That's exactly right. So Jesus is walking into a storyline that already exists that from the scriptures, the Old Testament itself, that the way um, the promised Messiah would come and overcome evil is by allowing violent men to overcome him. You have that already in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus does it. 
And John's now looking back on the whole thing. And that's why he depicts Jesus as um, the slain lamb. Uh, the theme develops in the book of Revelation in another dream vision that John has in chapter 7, where he sees an army. Um, well, actually, he hears an army. There's all these the followers of the Lamb who are um, going to be vindicated. Um, John describes them with uh, a, a military census that's uh, mostly copy and pasted from the book of Numbers, chapter 1 and 2. Okay. <laughs> so it's like this hyperlink to a right. census of the military fighters in Israel. So you're like, okay, all right, we're describing the army of yep. the Lord. Here comes right? the army, yeah. <laughs> Here comes the army. And, uh, it's, you know, all this number symbolism of Israelite armies from, from uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch in the Old Testament. That's what John hears. Again, he hears it. Then he turns his head, and what he sees is a, what he calls a multitude of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Huge sea of people. And what he sees is this group of people, and um, they, here, I'll just um, read it. They, um, they are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes, making them white in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Which wow. is another one of these... If lion and lamb is a clashing of metaphors. Yeah, right. White and your, blood. Totally. Yeah, totally. So in other words, these, these are um, the army of Jesus are those who have given up their lives just like Jesus has. They are the victors. They're the conquerors who are overcoming by not killing their enemies, but allowing evil people to kill them as they bear witness that Jesus is the true king of the world. So it's this literary, it's the same thing as earlier where John Correct. hears, you know, lion, thinks warrior, mm -hmm. and then he sees lamb. Mm -hmm. This time yes. he hears army, you know, 144,000, here's the military, sees yeah. all the martyrs. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, and the way the army um, wages war, you pick that up in, later on in chapter 12, um, where it talks about this army. And here in this scene in chapter 12, they're fighting the dragon and his army, which represents spiritual evil and those who give into it. And in chapter 12, verse 11, they, the army of Jesus, says they overcome. It's that Nike word again. Yeah. They conquer because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. They didn't love their lives even unto death. Wow. So just like Jesus, they give up their lives, and the way they fight and conquer is to let themselves be killed as they talk about King Jesus as the true king of the world. That's Holy the cow. It's so totally yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's amazing. amazing. It is amazing. So then you find out, oh, when all the way back to those seven churches, this is how you conquer the world. You let the world kill you if they want to. And my job is to imitate Jesus' self-giving love and enemy love. Just remind people that Jesus is the true king, whether you let me live <laughs> or whether you kill me. And again, we're talking about a, a moment in the history of the church where many cities were undergoing... Yeah, it's not a hypothetical scenario. Yeah, the Christians are actually being killed uh, in the communities, that some of the communities John's writing to. So this isn't just, he's not just doing theology. <laughs> uh, this is very practical. Um, so this uh, But then all of that, I think that all ahead. leads up to like what most people think of as chapter 19, where yes, then yes. you have Jesus and for sure in chapter 19, he's killing people because he's got blood <laughs> all over and he's yeah, got a sword. Yeah. I'll give you the beginning, but by the uh, time he has a sword in his mouth, that's it. Yes, that's right. So again, just remember Ender's Game. If you, if you walk out of the theater um, 15 minutes before the movie's end, Ender's Game is a pro-kill-the-aliens movie. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so this is one of those things where and you just have to... Just to clarify, don't watch the movie. Read the book. Can, can we agree on yeah, that? Totally. The, the movie, book's so much better. The movie that's was terrible. Exactly right. The book was fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Um, so it's the same thing here. You, ha you have to read through all the way to the end. And take into account everything you've read so far. So, yeah, so John sees his vision. Uh, he sees multiple visions, actually, of evil 
spiritual and human systemic evil being conquered and overcome. It happens in stages. But the most famous ones where Jesus rides in and he's depicted, this is the first time he's depicted as not the lamb. Um, and so we're already ready, we're already prepared to have our category shaped in a new way because he's been the lamb up to this point. Right. But now he's the rider on a horse, a white horse. And it says in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Now, already we have new definitions for how Jesus wages war given to us throughout the book, right? Um, then he goes on to hyperlink all of these passages from the Old Testament prophets. His eyes are a flame of fire. That's from Daniel chapter 10. On his head are many crowns. That's also from Daniel. He has a name written on him that nobody knows. That's from Exodus chapter 3. And then here we go. This is the hyperlink uh, to a poem in Isaiah chapter 63. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His ar- the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following him on white horses. There's the army again, with white robes. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so with it he may strike the nations. That's a quote from Psalm 2. And rule them with a rod of iron. That's a quote also from Psalm 2. And he treads the winepress of God's wrath, God the Almighty. That's a quote from Isaiah 63. How are you guys doing? We're, we're still with you. We're doing we're great. I got it open in front of me. I this is intense, but this is along. how these ninjas work. They just like, it's so subtle. And so what he's saying is, okay, Jesus, he is the messianic king talked about in all these different Genesis 49. Now he's bringing in Psalm 2. Um, he's using imagery of Isaiah 63, which is describing God as a wine. What do you call somebody who makes wine? A, vint- a vintner? What do you, what's the term? I wish I had the sophistication to answer that question. <laughs> a winemaker? I don't know. Um, it's, it's a scene describing God at, at a, a, a grape stomping party. You know, like you have the big harvest of grapes. You put them all in the big... Um, press, and then a bunch of people get in. They still do this in Italy, I think. I don't know. Um, you roll up, you know, your pants, and you start stomping grapes. And so that's the image of God defeating uh, violent, oppressive empires in Isaiah 63. It's very it's obvious that that's a violent image. Yeah, horrifying. <laughs> right? Um, so, so uh, but, and it's precisely what ancient oppressive empires did to smaller kingdoms like Israel and Judah, right? They yeah. come and stomp them out of existence. And so it's a, it's like a tit for tat kind of judgment. What the nations did to Israel, now God's going to do to the nations. That's Isaiah 63. But here in Revelation 19, he depicts Jesus um, as riding on a horse waging war. Now we already know how he wages war and conquers. Like that's already been made really clear. It's through, by giving up his through life. giving his life, yeah. His robe is dipped in blood. So that's right from Isaiah 63, where God's stomping on the grapes, and the blood of the grapes gets on his robe. Um, And so here is where you have to stop, and you have to say, okay. So he's quoting and pulling an image from an earlier biblical book, Isaiah 63. And many people think, therefore, this is the blood of his enemies, just like it is in Isaiah 63. And so uh, you can make that argument, but, but to do that, you have to say, John copied and pasted that phrase into here and expected it to have exactly the same meaning. And so you just have to stop and ask, really? <laughs> like this author is so sophisticated, has blood been an important image in the book so far? Right? I mean, not yeah, only has, yeah. is it important, it's a dominant image to talk about self-sacrificial love. Right, it's the it's the lamb with blood all o- its own blood all over it. That's how Jesus was introduced. Right, so right? the running okay. theme. This is not a new idea. The running theme. It's the army of the Lord that has the blood of the lamb on their robes. It makes them white. They wash themselves with the blood of the lamb. They accept Jesus' death as covering them, um, and they wage war with the blood of the lamb. Chapter twelve, um, with the word of their testimony. And so the fact that Jesus is has a robe dipped in blood, and his name's called the Word of God. That's, this is how Jesus wages war throughout the whole rest of the book of Revelation. 
is by dying for his enemies and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom, even if his enemies kill him. So does that kind of raise the question, whose blood is on his robe? Correct. I mean, to me, it's no question uh, that it's his own blood. Um, Not to mention that within the sequence of this vision here, the fighting hasn't even started yet. (laughs) <laughs> right. So, so he, just he, if you're if you're hearing that, I think Tim, you've been thinking yes. through this this through for a long time. For a lot of people, that's a brand new idea. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's good. So the let's, blood, let's, the blood on his robe. This is pre battle, and therefore yep. the leading theory is it's his own blood. Yes. Yeah. And I'm not making this up. Uh, there have been brilliant commentators and scholars on Revelation going back ma- many, many, many decades that have made this observation and argument. Um, and it's it's simple to make. If you look at how blood is used connected to Jesus in this book, it's always Jesus' own blood that is on him. Um, so that when we get to this scene, and even though he's using an image from Isaiah 63, he, John's already prepared us to know whose blood it is. Um, and so the fact, this is Jesus cresting the hill. This is like the battle at Helm's Deep, <laughs> right? In the in uh, the Lord of the Rings um where, you know, Gandalf rides, you know, right at sunrise and the lights behind him. And, Spoilers you know, for the Lord the, of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Spoilers all so, around. Just. Yeah, so this is that scene, right? It's his appearance. And what is he, what's already covering him as he appears over the hillside? Blood. Um, and that's because the blood is the way that he rescues. That's part of John's whole point in this book is the, the self sacrificial love, even unto death, is the way that Jesus conquered and the way that Jesus' army conquers. Uh, which is, is one thing to talk about it. It's a whole other thing to actually say, I'm going to try and live this way. Right. But, like, this is very, it's clearly what John's talking about here. So when, and, and when Jesus is swinging a sword later on in verse 15, from his mouth comes a sword, We already know how the conquering comes through the word, through Jesus saying he's king, and through the army of the lamb. Remember, they conquer by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Which is, and by word of their testimony, is that kind of John's language for what we would call the gospel? So the idea of a sword coming out of the mouth or the word of the lamb is this idea of speaking the yes. gospel or the good news that Jesus is king, that the kingdom of God is here and it's coming Correct. and has implications for everything. And yes. this word, this logos, this message, it's like a sword. It's just cutting Correct. right through the yeah. world that we call home. Is that the right interpretation? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the sword is a metaphor for the power and effectiveness of the announcement that Jesus is the king of the world. And you know it's a metaphor because it's coming out of his Mouth. Mouth. <laughs> exactly. Jesus has Actually, a strong we, in, a, in a Bible Project video, we, we first drew this scene with the caricature, drawing all the images literally. Uh, and then we went through one by one. And that just showed. sounds like terrifying. Like, don't show that it to was. your children it's bizarre, before bed. It's a bizarre image. Um, so, uh, anyway, th- there you go. Even right through the last book of the Bible, which is full of military imagery, violent vocabulary, blood, if you pay attention, this is very sophisticated, and he's subverting each of those in light of the story of Jesus' death for his enemies and his resurrection. Man, that's incredible. So that's a quick, it is incredible. I, I stand in awe of what John has, has done here in the book of Revelation, and we're just following one theme through. Um, he's buried Easter egg, like little trails of breadcrumbs like this, Dozens of them where you can follow a key word through from the first page to the last. And he's constantly doing this, playing it off Old Testament hyperlinks, developing it in light of the story of Jesus, and then showing how it creates uh, a calling for the church in the present. It's, be- it's beautiful. Anyway, there you go. I could go on. but that's- <laughs> No, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's the thing you asked me to talk about. Yeah, yeah thank you. Super helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. Tim, you know, when you talk about Revelation, there's a bit of a a grain of salt because most folks uh, realize that Revelation, at the very least, is a confusing book. Uh, You know, we Mm. we recognize when we read it that some strange stuff is going on. uh, And and when you actually start to unpack it before you get into how subversive and actually nonviolent the book is, 
we're yeah. already understanding that it's written in a genre for which modern readers have no paradigm. So yes. uh, it, it invites a very nuanced conversation. But when you have a conversation about the Old Testament, things get a bit more dicey uh, because in the Old Testament is just replete with uh, violence, some of which seems to implicate God or be commissioned by God himself. And that's couched in actual uh, mm-hmm. narrative rather than this kind of symbolic yeah, it prose. Reads, it reads more like history than a literary. You right. Know. And yeah. we actually had a number of folks, like John Mark was saying, uh, that voiced uh, very legitimate questions that weren't based on common common sense logic. You know, what would happen if we actually did this and all that kind of thing, but were more based in well, what what are we supposed to do yeah. with these narratives from the Old Testament? You know, one one person yeah. in particular actually wrote in and said, um, "Why would God be upset about military violence now when He seems to actually commission and command military violence in some Old Testament narratives?" Can you mm-hmm. sort of begin to walk us through the weirdness of the Old Testament? Yeah. Knowing, knowing this is a can of worms, and there are, yeah, there are no totally. e- yeah, there's so much going on here. I don't mean can of worms in a in a derogatory you know way toward the Old Testament, but it's just there's no easy answers, you know, when it yeah. comes to the violent portraits of God and violence in the Old Testament. But would you yeah. at least start us down a path? Yeah, uh, and I, the more again, the more I think and talk about this, the, the more. Even though there aren't easy answers, there are ways forward from at least our current status of just confusion or right. being scandalized. Um, so, and um, the, the same thing holds. It's a, Old Testament narrative is just a different genre than Jewish apocalyptic, but the same principle holds. This is highly sophisticated literature, and you can't equate something happening in a narrative with. This is therefore is God's will because this story is in the Bible. Uh, even things that God does, He says <laughs> uh, at multiple points, is this was not my ideal will, but, and we can talk about that, but. Um, so, first things first, again, you have to read the story in order because any story, the opening scenes and the final scenes are crucially, crucially important. So the fact, when does violence appear for the first time in the Bible? It's the story of Cain and Abel um, on on page four. And it's a story of one brother who's angry at the favor God is showing towards another family member. And they begin to resent them. I wonder if any of us have ever lived this story before. (laughs) (laughs) Right? And so that whole story is about how once the humans have seize the knowledge of good and evil for themselves, they're going to start redefining good and evil. And so Cain is the first one who redefines good to be murdering a family member because of my resentment and anger. That's the first act of violence in the Bible. It's a human act of selfish resentment. And it's one of the first examples of the fallout of original sin. Am I right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. It's the first. Yep. It's um, yeah, you know, t- taking from a tree, we're kind of like, okay, I, I, maybe I understand that, maybe I don't. <laughs> I don't. Maybe you know, some people would be, what was so bad about that? But killing your brother because you're, you know, like jealous, like that's just bad. And Nobody... it's, a, it's a sign that clearly <laughs> something has gone wrong in the human correct. condition at this point. That's correct. That's and I, right. I just think so, it's telling that the first example of now what is wrong with the world in the wake of chapter yes. three. Is yes. violence. Yeah, it's violence. It's totally. And I, it's very important to read the sequence of stories together. So you get Cain and Abel. Then Cain goes and he builds a city. And we only get one picture of what life in the city that he built is. Um, and it's a poem. It's just this guy uh, who wait, speaks up. Wait, and he's, I'm going to interrupt you, which hopefully yeah. this will be the first time I interrupt you. Because there's something <laughs> else like, in that story that I'd yes, love to okay, have you speak to that I think is so fascinating. What is God's response to Cain's violence? I'd love to have you speak to that. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, so he comes and he asks, what he asks Cain is, where's your brother? <laughs> uh, so he doesn't come stomping grapes. What he comes is he says, where's your brother? Right. And Cain says, I don't know. Am I supposed to be my protecting brother's keeper. my brother? Yeah. And then God says, what have you done? Your brother's blood, the sound of your brother's blood is shouting to me from the ground. 
So, so what we hear in this narrative, yeah, exactly. I see why you're asking me to speak to this. So the, the fundamental portrait of God and violence on the, in the first time violence appears in the Bible is the violent, the violent death of the innocent is something so horrendous to God that it, the, the blood cries, it Out shouts to wow. up to heaven to God and God hears it. And when he hears, uh, he puts in motion a plan to bring ultimate justice. This but, is the same. But um, that, go ahead. But that, yep. that is what I think is so fascinating. So you have the blood cries up from the ground, but then God's response is not to kill off Cain. Correct. That's correct. So yes. what I think is yes. just beyond, I have it open right now in front of me on my laptop, but you have that fascinating line about how the Lord, this is in verse, chapter 4, verse 15, the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So God's response, you would imagine, especially reading the Old Testament, is capital punishment. You killed your brother, now I kill you. Mm-hmm. But actually God's response is to put a mark on Cain mm-hmm. to protect him from violence. And then the next thing, you have Cain goes on to become the founder of urban culture. So, and there's, that's yeah. a mixed bag. <laughs> and I, and I, but it and, almost and reads those... like good is coming out of this murderer's life. Good is coming out of it. Mm-hmm. Am I, yeah, that, I'm missing and, and something. that's important. The the sign and the and the city that he builds are are connected because people have wondered for a long time what's the sign <laughs> uh, that God puts on Cain so that uh, no one will kill him. Well, the next thing in the narrative is that he builds the city. What's interesting this is this is very typical of these early Genesis narratives. They are full of vocabulary that points forward to things coming later in the story. There's going to be this institution when the Israelites go into the land called cities of refuge. Um, And they're cities that are markers of God's protection uh, for for murderers. Wow. (laughs) Um, And they're to the place to which the murderer can flee in case the avenger of blood finds them um, until there can be due process and a court hearing and that kind of thing. Um, and so many people think that that's buried, that this, that the Cain's being able to build a city that becomes a protective refuge for him is the sign. Um, that's a very ancient, actually, Jewish interpretation. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's amazing. But so that's exactly right. God doesn't kill the first murderer, <laughs> but he does make clear that what he did is horrendous. Right. And is, and upsets the natural order. Um, and, and then things go wrong in Cain's city. He builds the city, and the only thing we're told, the only inhabitant, we're told about three inhabitants, a man with two wives, which is also screwed up. <laughs> That's not, definitely not what God had in mind on page one for right. marriage. And then he sings this poem about how, you know, Cain murdered his brother, but, you know, this young guy walked up to me and slapped me, and I just killed him on the spot. <laughs> I mean, he's singing this, like, celebration song about murdering somebody and vengeance and, and vengeance yeah. and the whole thing. It's very John it's, Wick. <laughs> so, so well, here we go. The, the first murder is human. Then we get God's response. Now it's spreading. It's spreading to the city. Um, then you go to uh, page six, Genesis chapter six, and the introduction to the story of the flood is this violence has spread three times the word. The earth was corrupted with gross violence, people murdering each other all over the place. And this is what causes God to regret that he even made humans in the first place. So to me, this early story is really important because it's showing us the baseline portrait of God's relationship to violence. He hates it. It's something that humans do because they redefine good and evil. Um, and it's something that ruins God's world. It actually um, violates the order that God wants for his world. Um, so, but, and so it's actually helpful because then what is God's response? The flood. <laughs> and so I'm laughing as a, yeah, because, I guess, a way to yes, exactly. ease the tension or something. But um, <laughs> Okay, so but, but we need to even think about what's happening with the flood. What the way the narrative depicts the flood is? It's a, there's all these narrative parallels between the starting of the the flood and the storm, uh, and the description of uh, the creation. This uh, in Genesis one, 
And you can compare it right down to the Hebrew text, item by item, line by line, everything that God created as good and created as ordered and divided and separated and ordered becomes disordered and is brought back into chaos in Genesis, in the flood description. Um, in other words, what God is doing, he created a world for order. He makes humans. The humans start to vandalize the thing. And so what he does, the, the flood is the act of God, like releasing creation back into chaos again. It's as if this is important because the, what the picture of God's response he didn't kill Cain. Right? So that's not, he didn't kill Adam and Eve. He didn't kill Cain. He didn't kill Lamech. But when the whole world is full of humans who are plunging the world back into disorder, God reaches this point where he says, okay, if that's what you want, then you can have disorder. And the flood is essentially like a decreation story. Uh, and it's because humans, he says, because humans are wicked all of the time. So, so, so two things, and then I'm happy to dialogue with you guys about this. So then the flood subsides, but he say, you know, he spares Noah and his family. And so Noah and his family get off the boat. And then the first thing Noah does is make a sacrifice. This is in chapter 8. And what God says is um, when Noah gets off the boat and makes a sacrifice, God says, this is chapter 8, verse 21, I will never again curse the ground because of humans. Because the purpose of the human heart is evil from youth. And I'll never destroy every living thing as I've done. So in other words, what, what was the cause of the flood? The purpose of the human heart was evil from the youth. Right? right. So it brought the flood. Now, when once the flood's over, what does God recognize about humans? They're exactly the same. He just says it. The, intent, the purpose of the human heart is evil from youth. And what is God's response? I'm not ever going to do that again. So what the flood shows is not a change in the human condition, violence. It shows a change in God. That God is now going to deal with all, all with his world like he dealt with Cain. He's not going um, to destroy the whole world because of their violence and evil. Rather, he's going to set in motion a plan to rescue and redeem it. So those early stories in Genesis are really important, and I think we they need to govern how we read the whole rest of the story. Okay, I've just talked for a long time. I, <laughs> no, <what> I mean, <laughs> that's fantastic and some fascinating insight, but I think where most people's minds go at this yes. point is, okay, that sounds cool, he didn't kill Cain, but what about the war for Canaan? And then what about, yes. you know, Kings and Samuel, where there's battle after yeah. battle and war after war, and David was a man after God's own heart, and he was a warrior, and it seems like God is behind that, um, at least some of the time. How does that square with yeah. the military violence, with the full-on nationalism that we see in Israel later yeah. on in the Old Testament? So it's great, you're saying, read yeah. that in light of the beginning of Genesis, which is where we kind of see everything that God originally intended for the world, and we kind of mm -hmm. see the root system of what's gone awry in the world, mm -hmm. and we see mm -hmm. that violence is not a side issue, it's a central issue to what is right and what's wrong with the world. But yeah. how, do you, how do you square that? I just want to go right where most people's minds go. Yeah, totally. Me too. Me too. So again, we need... I, uh, and I'm work. I'm working this out real time. Yeah. <laughs> again, there's us, there's no easy the answer here. Yeah, there's no right. like oh point one two but, three. But so again, all all these narratives about Canaanite conquest, David, and so on, just because these characters are doing violence, and just because God um, is with these people, doesn't mean this is a perfect expression of God's will. It it might be a compromise. It might be way less than the ideal. And we've already seen that. Like humans now, very clearly, on the other side of the flood, are still the same. Like nothing has changed. But God's commitment now is to work with them as they are. And meet them where they're at. That's exactly right. So this is like and the so, idea in some of the literature you read about divine accommodation. Is that what correct. you're getting at? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So God's going to put up with and commit himself to people. That, that doesn't mean he approves of their behavior. <laughs> um, and, and especially once, I mean, he's going to marry this human family of Abraham. He's going to make a series of covenants um, 
which are depicted with metaphors of marriage. And, uh, you know, it's very, it's very similar to, um, like, two nations forming a treaty and the compromises that are involved. Right. Um, basically, any interactions between humans that are truly going to honor each other's will are going to involve forms of compromise. And I give up my, my ideal, you give up your ideal, but we're able to find a way forward together. And so that's exactly the relationship of God and Israel and all, all of these characters. Um, so God's committed to bringing redemption to his world through a human family. That's the whole point of the story. And so to do that, I mean, putting up with humans and humans are violent. We already learned that from the first pages of the Bible. And so um, I, I, in my mind, that governs. Every story where God is, say, commissioning the Israelites to go into the land, um, it, he's, al- he's already making a compromise in that the Israelites, at many times, most of their history, think that he's just their national tribal God. Um, and there's a lot of stories where God seems to be depicted in that way, right? In the book of Joshua, um, it seems like God's pro-Israel and anti-Canaanite. And so he um, sanctions the Israelites to engage in this form of of ritual warfare. And I'm with you. Uh, Personally, these narratives are the ones that I struggle with most in the entire Bible. This is my greatest question in the entire Bible. Yeah, it's the greatest up at night kind of thing. Yeah, But but what you're saying, (laughs) this idea of divine accommodation... Is, mm-hmm. It's not a new idea, and mm-hmm. most people are already there. So, you know, everybody reads the story about the king, and it's crystal clear in the narrative that God never wanted a king for Israel. Yeah, that's right. Israel wanted a king, and so you end up not only with a king, but a king who's in relationship with God and God blessing David, even though God never wanted David, but Correct. God meeting him when they're, they're where they are at. And then yes. pushing and pulling them forward. You see the same thing in the Torah, obviously, with the laws around women, children, slavery. It's crystal clear mm-hmm. that's not the heart of God. But again, mm-hmm. divine accommodation, meeting them where they're at, pushing and pulling yes. them forward from Code of Hammurabi or whatever. So you're yeah. saying apply that same hermeneutic, that same mm-hmm. way of reading the Bible as there are moments when God accommodates mm-hmm. to where humanity is at, meets them there, gets his yes. hands dirty in order yes. to, not just to compromise, but to push and pull them forward where the yes. end goal is, of course, Jesus is teaching his way. You're saying yes. apply that hermeneutic, that way of reading the Bible to a number of the violent stories, the war yes. stories, yeah. the military battle stories apply think of it that way is that what i'm hearing you say that that is what I, and it doesn't solve everything um and uh, greg boyd um his most recent book has really i think made that clear <laughs> right or at least he's really arguing that but I, but i still think that point gets has a lot of mileage to it yes um it doesn't get you all the it, way but it takes you through a whole lot of stuff that's right because we just need to learn we need to need to learn this category just because god is with david and because David does violence doesn't mean that God, this, the, the violence that David did is God's ideal will or ideal purpose. And you even get that hint when David wants to build the temple, which is, yes, yes, yeah, totally. that's a fantastic. Yes. And God's reasoning for why he can't is because you're a man of blood. Yeah, you keep, you've killed so many people. How could you build the temple? <laughs> that's what he says. Um, yeah, so you just have right. that little moment of truth where you're like, God, mm-hmm. he's like, no, that, that's over the line, you know? Yes, and, I, there's, and this is where those stories, in a strange way, have become really comforting to me because they show the strength of God's commitment to, to people, um, that, that God will allow himself to engage in things that are not becoming of his ideal purpose or character because he's committed to this person and I, I, but that doesn't get you all the way. <laughs> right. But I think you get a lot of mileage. And nowhere has this become more real to me than parenting. You know, um, of like what you know, you tell your kid not to do something, not to do something, then they do it. So I'm not going to disown them. <laughs> so, um, but now that they've done that thing, it changes the game, and I have to work with them in light of that stupid decision that they made. Right. And we go forward, and things are not ideal anymore. But we're gonna. F- find a way forward. Right. And so to me, that it's the covenant commitment of God and the accommodation that to me, I think you can get a lot of mileage 
for many of these stories out of there. However, there just simply are some narratives where there is divinely sanctioned violence um, that, that seems like it's initiated out of God, God's will, and didn't have to happen. Um, there's a handful of stories where God tells, um, like, uh, uh, Saul to go uh, take vengeance on the Amalekites for something they did 400 years ago, you know, to the Israelites. And he says, kill them all, you know. And we're just like, whoa, that is so intense. Um, and so uh, to me, that's where the nub of the issue is. You could say... Um, you could just say, yeah, that's what God did, and God was exacting vengeance, and sometimes God does that. Um, you could say uh, Greg Boyd's proposal is that there, in these types of stories, there's actually not that many, but in these handful of Old Testament stories, God is allowing himself to be depicted uh, as a kind of God that he actually isn't by the Old Testament authors just because of their limited horizon and point of view. Um, and that's what I'm pondering right now. Is, yeah, uh, that's where you um, get to no easy answers. Correct, yeah. And uh, be, be, in, uh, it's mostly just because, okay, you're talking about those narratives, but those narratives occur within the Hebrew Bible, which the Hebrew Bible itself is telling me that God's ultimate victory will come through the suffering servant right. king who dies for his enemies. Like that's the ultimate storyline of the Old Testament. And so I have to reconsider these narratives in light of that suffering and servant that. victory. So, and so that's the that's the place where I'm at. So, right so now. closing, we could talk for hours about. I wish we, we had time could, totally, to talk yeah. about you know active wrath versus passive wrath and the, the idea of God mm-hmm. handing us over to evil and the yes, consequences yes. of our own evil as the primary example of God's wrath. But we're out of time. We want to honor your time. But closing question to drag it back to our life today and how we follow Jesus, yeah. what we do, what we don't do. Here's another question from somebody in our church. How would you push a point of nonviolence to someone who uses God's destruction on people in the Old Testament as a justification mm. for their violence against evil? So I'm guessing, you know, the kind of the line of reasoning you hear, well, there was a military, there was violence in the Old Testament, God used it, therefore God uses it now, and that's why I kill, or that's why I serve in the military, or that's why whatever. How would you answer? It's a great question. How would you answer? Yeah, it is a, it is a good question. The base issue there, I believe, is just a misunderstanding of what the Bible is. So if the Bible is just this kind of flat text that's a divine behavior manual and so i just pull from different parts to discover god what god wants me to do whether it's from genesis or leviticus right indiscriminately just pull from different parts right Right. then i think that that's what generates that kind of question people in the bible did this i follow the bible therefore i'm going to do that so that what it's ignoring that the bible is a narrative storyline um and that my role in the story of Jesus fits into one particular part of the story. And so I'm a part of the Jesus section of the story. So I'm not a part of the ancient Israelite people that's in a national covenant, you know, with Yahweh, with a temple, with a standing army. So, uh, and that's where those narratives live is in that section of the story. So I'm a part of the new covenant people of, of Jesus, the Messiah, who overcame by loving his enemies even unto death and was vindicated by the resurrection. And the way that that covenant people follows God's will is to imitate Jesus and his self-giving love. Um, so I think you could just say, if you, if you sit down in the part of the biblical story that we are in, uh, to adopt that kind of posture... Uh, of the military violence can forward the kingdom of God. I think ultimately that's a betrayal of Jesus and everything that he stood for. Um, and it's a, just a misreading of the Bible as, as a whole. That's my not very short answer. <laughs> wow, that's a bombshell. But, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I could not agree yeah. more. Thank you for saying yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for your time, Tim. Uh, gosh, I wish we could do this for six hours, like on the Bible Project. <laughs>